Shalom, family. It is your sister in Christ, Lady Summer. And I am coming back with part four, chapter four. But before I get into the book, I just wanted to acknowledge how special today is prophetically. Um, even going back to 1988 with the theme, Make It Last Forever, I was 18 years old. And it was my prom. And my brother took me to the prom. And I'm going to fast forward to 2017. December 22nd was actually the date that we were sitting in darkness and saw a great light. <laughs> there was so much going on, too, prophetically. There were fires burning. I mean, it was 2017 was amazing prophetically. Um, it just seemed like we were walking through the end times, and apparently that is what we've been doing. And then on this same date, December 22nd, the following year, there was a tsunami in Sunda Strait. Now, it was prophetic because that name comes from Sunda Kingdom, and it was a kingdom that rules the western part of of java and it was actually two days into hanukkah and then one more year later same day december 22nd 2019 actually on the first day of the week of sunday hanukkah began again and hanukkah is the festival of lights and this year we are experiencing the festival of lights and dedication a feast of dedication so i call it the festival of lights and bread see there's no need for the candle it says in revelation 22 it says and there shall be no night there no darkness and they need no candle neither light of the sun for the lord god giveth them light and they shall reign forever and ever Revelation 22, verse 5. 22 represents revelation and the revealing, and 5 represents Christ. The other scripture in Revelation, and it's no coincidence that it's Revelation 18, because 18 represents slavery and bondage, but it also represents double life. And there it also talks about the light of the candle in verse 23. 23 represents the daughters of Israel, the daughters of Zion, and it also represents the judge of Israel, who is Yah. Yah is the judge, and Yah has judged. And this verse says, And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be no more heard at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. So all of the things that they do now with the dreidel and the this and the that, we don't need to do those things because we have the Lord with us. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the spirits of the prophets. We have the angels. And the most important thing is we have the word of God and we have understanding of that word and the power of his name and of his Holy Ghost. And in Revelation is the only book where it speaks about the light of the candle shall shine no more at all and they need no candle because it is directly related to Hanukkah. It's also no coincidence that this is the fourth day of Hanukkah that the Lord gave me this message because on this day in my notes, and it was year 2019, because that was the end of the Gentile age, the end of the unbelieving age, I have exactly four notes written on this day and they're all prophetic the first note says my life fulfills the prophecy of what god said to me the second note says 
I'm calling you out of your hiding, your box, your comfort zone. You are the one who's going to blaze the trail. Everything you have encountered in your life is not a lost cause. This is the time. God is getting ready to resurrect your life. The old is behind you and the new is before you. God is not through with you. God is not finished working in you. God is not through with you. So keep on pressing, pressing your way, your way through. God is not through with you yet. He still has your life ready for his plan. So keep on pressing on. Keep on praying. Keep on praising because God is not through with you yet. There is nothing that has been constructed that's going to be able to take you out of it. No weapons formed against me shall prosper. And you say that as well. A new season has come. God is moving the blockage, the holdup, something that was standing in the way, the movement and flow not to flow through. This day, you will see an immediate change because the stoppage has been broken. You are being shaped and molded for destiny. I remember you. God keeps you on his mind, even when you think he's forgotten. You are in the mind of God, and he is working it all out. He's going to talk you out of your sleep. He's going to divinely orchestrate the pieces, where to put this and where to put that. The pieces coming together, creating a story, a system, a strategy. Everything is coming together, all for one story. You will see the end results. He's hiding in the shadows, preparing things to come upon you in 2020. Anointed to teach and preach. 2019 is preparation for 2020 things. And he's going to straighten out everything. And there won't be a hindrance in your way. You are not forgotten. I'm just preparing you for what I have for you. Thank you that the spirit of discouragement is broken. You will arise and be a voice for the displaced and emotionally and mentally bound to set the captives free, break the power of cursed words. He is for his people. Get ready to get promoted. Obeying God is the key. Only be moved by what you believe. And this is the thing. In the church that day, right after that was said, an alarm rang for exactly two minutes. Listen to this. And I'll never forget it. From 1247 to 1249. These were my ages. 47 to 49, 2017 to 2019. And 49 was the seven sevens, the seven weeks. You know, I, I was dealing with the sevens because that's God's number. And so I wrote here the reward of the pursuit because 2019, I was in pursuit of him. So this was the scripture I wrote, Hebrews 11, 1, faith in God, faith to believe God. By faith, we seek God. By faith, we please God. By faith, we receive results and rewards. Because the Holy Spirit, that gift, that is a reward. To be in this time and understand exactly where we are is a gift. It's a reward. First John 3, 22, God responds to me when I practice his commands. He gives me clout with himself and gives me favor with him. We do things he likes. Okay. The next message was revelations means revealer of mysteries. When there is disunity in the building, God is displeased. The building, I'm not talking about the one made with human hands loving people you have to do that 
because that's what it takes to maintain unity. Conducting yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, standing together, united in spirit, bearing the name of Jesus Christ. And this is the scripture. And when your land is once more filled with people, says the Lord, you will no longer wish for the good old days when you possessed the ark of the Lord's covenant. You will not miss those days or even remember them. And there will be no need to rebuild the ark. In that day, Jerusalem will be known as the throne of the Lord. All nations will come there to honor the Lord. They will no longer stubbornly follow their own evil desires. In those days, the people of Judah and Israel will return together from exile in the north. They will return to the land I gave your ancestors as an inheritance forever. I thought to myself, I would love to treat you as my own children. I wanted nothing more than to give you this beautiful land, the finest possession in the world. I looked forward to your calling me father, and I wanted you never to turn from me. Wow. Voices are heard high on the windswept mountains, the weeping and pleading of Israel's people, for they have chosen crooked paths and have forgotten the Lord, their God, because the Lord is God. My wayward children, says the Lord, come back to me and I will heal your wayward hearts. Yes, we're coming, the people reply, for you are the Lord, our God. Our worship of idols on the hills and our religious orgies on the mountains are a delusion. Only in the Lord our God will Israel ever find salvation. From children, we have watched as everything our ancestors worked for, their flocks and herds, their sons and daughters, was squandered on a delusion. Let us now lie down in shame and cover ourselves with dishonor for we and our ancestors have sinned against the lord our god from our childhood to this day we have never obeyed him jeremiah 3 16 through 19 and verse 21 through 25 and that was the new living translation because this is a living word and the next scripture and the last note is from Colossians 1, 24 through 29. Also, I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation. And my note I had under it is Jesus Christ is Lord. Jehovah saves. Yahweh is the name above all other names because he is the God of gods. Exodus chapter 6 verse 3 says, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, which we know later he became Israel, by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. Jehovah means the same as Adonai, which means my Lord. Yahweh is Jehovah. And with the vows of Adonai, it means my Lord. And he said that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob did not know him as my Lord. They knew him as God Almighty. But thanks be to the Father who sent his only begotten Son. We are able to know the Father because of Jesus. In Philippians chapter 2 verses 9 through 11, and remember we've learned that 9, 11 means get into alignment, 9, 10, 11, just like that. It says, wherefore God also have highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow 
of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. For God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God, perfect in their relationship to Christ. That's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. The Apostle Paul said this, he wrote it to the Colossians. And the word Colossians comes from the name Colossae, and it means city of refuge and the confederacy of herders, like a cow herd. And interestingly enough, Paul's letter to the Colossians is certainly not about what it seems to be about, but instead a sophisticatedly coded polemic addressed to folks who were most likely not even actually living in Colossae, but who were very actually bent on resisting, opposing, and ultimately destroying the Roman Empire. His main theme was the very nature of the gospel movement. It has nothing to do with any particular religion, denomination, or sect, but it was a broad base of general knowledge. And you can refer to 1 Kings 4.33, Hosea 4.6, Isaiah 5.13, John 21.25, Romans 1.20, and also a technological sophistication, Exodus 31, verse 1 through 11, an investigation of all things, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, and a helpfulness to the entire world, including any Roman, pagan, Scythian, Hellene, slave, master, woman, or child. Galatians 3:28. Matthew 19, 14, and lastly, the gospel of Christ applies to all people in the whole world, even the whole creation, which is why he told us, preach the gospel to every creature. Now, you have a choice. You can believe it or don't, but you will also either receive the blessings for believing or the curses for not. So that was just a little intro into chapter four. Let us get underway. A happy Hanukkah, the fourth day. I'm going to read chapter four. It is titled Great Faith from the dream book, The Road to the Promised Land by Humwa Summer C. Marshall. Lord, my God, you have now made me king, and I put in brackets, queen at your side. You have put me in the place of my father, David, but I'm only a little child. I don't know how to carry out my duties. I'm here among the people you have chosen. They are a great nation. They are more than anyone can count. So give me a heart that understands. Then I can rule over your people. I can tell the difference between what is right and what is wrong. Who can possibly rule over this great nation of yours? 
1 Kings 3, verse 7 through 9. In the dream I had of my mother in the spring of 2016, she told me she saw me. My faith increased greatly that year, and my journey began. As I said in a previous chapter, seems that my mother's prayers were coming true for me, and I was indeed living in the end times. It makes sense now that although I was born on Resurrection Sunday, I was born at nighttime. I was born in sin and born in a dark time. I was born in wartime, on battlegrounds, into a great spiritual war. I was born enslaved in a land foreign of my ancestors. I spoke about the woman caught in the act of adultery in the eighth chapter of John and how Jesus rewrote history when he wrote in the dirt. I believe this scripture is closely related to Jeremiah 18 and Isaiah 9 through 11, but I digress. Adultery represents cheating on God and worshiping false gods and idols instead of him. He is a jealous God, and why shouldn't he be? He created you. Remember, the church is also represented by a woman. See, the woman was caught in adultery, and the religious leaders and Pharisees brought her to Jesus in order to get him to say something against the law. He was not concerned about their accusations about the woman. Instead, Jesus nonchalantly stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. Then afterwards, he stood up and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he went back to writing. The Bible says when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. The reason they slipped away is because they saw what he wrote in the dirt. Isn't that what the accusers are doing today? They see the writing on the wall, and that is what the Holy Spirit is pouring on certain people, and not everyone is having an experience with God, especially those who say, Lord, Lord. Don't they hide in the shadows and talk about you behind your back and mock you? But God, he sees all. Truly he does. Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Those words are prophetic. See that with your spiritual eyes. All of the Pharisees and religious leaders, all men, said nothing but slipped away, leaving Jesus there in the middle of the crowd with the woman. So Jesus stooped down twice to write in the dust. This is symbolic for him coming down to earth twice. And then he stood up or rose up and said, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. This woman washed her robe. Jesus, with his writing in the dust or the soil, saved her from being stoned to death. Those were some powerful words. Maybe it's the reason he later says, I will not judge those who hear me, but don't obey. For I have come to save the world and not to judge it. But all who reject me and my message will be judged on the day of judgment by the truth I have spoken. He said people would be judged by his words. And we just started chapter 3 out by speaking about the word of God judging the heart. I don't speak on my own authority. The Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. And I know his commands lead to eternal life. So I say whatever the Father tells me to say. John 12, verse 47 through 50. Jesus said that he will not judge those who hear his voice. This means they believe the words he spoke when they heard them. But because they didn't stay connected to him through his word and his Holy Spirit, their flesh becomes weak and they fall into sin or they fall for the enemy's tricks because they have no discernment. Jesus died for our sins, past, present, and future. When will you believe it? What has to happen for you to just believe it? 
Jesus was speaking on the authority of the Father the first time he came. And those who recognized him recognized the Holy Spirit in the flesh and recognized him as the Messiah. And they were able to experience his power and take advantage of the gifts because they believed. And this is what brought glory to God. I believe this is why he's talking to me, because I believe all of it. Jesus was following the instructions of his father by teaching the correct doctrine, no matter what the naysayers were saying or doing, and that was the glory to be manifested in the earth. I believe this scripture is symbolic for the time we are about to enter. See, the woman was given a bad rap all throughout history history because she listened to the devil but she was redeemed through childbirth now eve didn't take responsibility for her own actions initially when we read genesis because she blamed the devil for her choice to eat what was forbidden however god knew that she was deceived and under a strong delusion also and it's exactly what daniel describes will happen to the house of Israel and the elect in the end times. The Bible tells us the Lord God, he will put man again in a deep sleep like he did with Adam when he made Eve and as he did when he sent the false prophet Balaam in order to test those who belong to this world like it says in Revelation 3. God does this because man wants to live for himself. Man wants to live for his own pleasure. And not only does he not love the truth, he is not interested in hearing the truth, and especially from a woman. These people are dying because they refuse to love the truth. The truth would save them. So God will fool them completely. Then they will believe the lie. Many will not believe the truth. They will take pleasure in evil. They will be judged. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 through 12. And just as the man will be put into a deep sleep, the woman will be taken from him again. And this time she will not listen to the devil, but instead she will take refuge or cover under the Lord's mighty right arm and hand. Though she is not respected and often ignored on the main stages of society, especially if she's not all made up and not hanging from a pole or have the perfect body, she remains in the background and her wisdom is ignored. Instead, Jezebel or Vashti are put on the stage front and center with a tiara placed on her head with full-on makeup, jewels, expensive bags, and all her cosmetics. God is not pleased because he warned us not to judge by appearance. Yes, Eve listened to the serpent because she was under a strong delusion and she didn't listen to the instructions her husband gave her. That's symbolic for the bride listening to the bridegroom and Jesus is the bridegroom. The daughters have to live holy and righteous and listen to the father because Lucifer knew the word. He twisted God's words, and it was her downfall for not only listening, but following through, and then including someone else in her sin. I believe the first time God spoke to Eve was the first time she sinned, and up until that day, she received her instruction from Adam. She hadn't heard it directly from the father for herself, and Adam was off doing his own thing, and maybe she was feeling neglected. Her allegiance should have been to her husband, nonetheless, and she should have trusted the words given to him by the Lord God Almighty. The first go-around, Adam was the first messenger, the first Christ. However, it was beyond her merely being deceived. She actually listened to the wrong voice, which was in direct opposition of God's spoken word, which caused them to be dispelled from the Garden of Eden, which was the Holy of Holies, the most holy place on earth. People seem to forget the Garden of Eden is here on earth. However, later in scripture, we see how God chastised Adam because it was to him that the command was given not to eat of the tree in the middle of the garden and not Eve. Eve acted on what she was told because she believed a lie. 
Eve also looked with her eyes. I had to stop listening and looking at things that opposed my creator. I had to physically stop doing things and going to places that would cause my spirit to be grieved because I was born to live a holy life. It's in my bloodline. It was predestined for me to be this way. In John 8, we clearly see the accusers inspired by Satan himself representing the accuser of the brethren running away from the truth and it said beginning with the oldest these scriptures are symbolic of what is to come these accusers are religious people who've been in church all their lives and they know the word scripture and verse but they have no relationship with the holy spirit just like the religious leaders of the past they can tell what the bible says but they don't live it and are not close to God in their hearts, which separates them from being able to hear from the Holy Spirit. The Bible clearly warns, do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 Though these people have a form of godliness, which is an outward appearance, always at the church building and doing church work. But they don't realize they are in rebellion and they are powerless. You can scream Jesus' name, but if you don't believe it, it holds no power for you. They will fulfill the scripture that says, anyone who teaches something different is arrogant and lacks understanding. Such a person has an unhealthy desire to quibble over the meaning of words. This stirs up arguments ending in jealousy, division, slander, and evil suspicions. These people always cause trouble. Their minds are corrupt and they have turned their backs on the truth. To them, a show of godliness is just a way to become wealthy. Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth, the transfer. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 4 through 7. The latter of the verse talks about people who long to be rich, self-pleasure seekers, and how they will fall into a trap. These will be the people that won't listen to you. They will tell you their opinion and their feelings and their thoughts, which have absolutely nothing to do with the word of God. They have no relationship with the Lord. And so they can't see or hear what thus saith the Lord. They are in a deep sleep and their God is a material one. Whether it's money or stuff, all tangible, they grow weary in waiting. They end up running away from the messenger whom God has sent because the spirit reveals their true nature and they love their lives too much. They are afraid of being exposed, which I'm going to start right there. That's what the naked means, exposed. Their hearts are far, far, far away from God, and they do not obey his word. The closer you get to the Lord, you begin to understand that prophecy is not literal because you have to have ears to hear it, and you have to search out the matter like kings and queens in order to be able to understand what you are reading. See, none of them were without sin. We read that in Amos 5. This is how it will be in the last days. Only the true word of God will stand against the lies of the enemy. And there is no perfect person, only Jesus. It is by his grace that we are saved. It is by his word that we know the way. It is by his truth that we dispel the lies. This is why he died for us. This is why he sent his Holy Spirit back for us. Jesus was that word in the flesh. He knew the whole Bible because it was his life. He was the very thing the prophets prophesied about. He was the high priest, the king, and the prophesied Messiah. And though at that time he didn't come to take his place on the throne, he came to complete his assignment. He came to give us a way to the Father. He came to die so we could live just like the people of that time. People are not looking for him. And so they did not and will not recognize the signs of his coming, nor the time of their visitation. 
I'm going to pause right there because remember in John 14, him and his father were going to come to you. So when he told the woman that he doesn't condemn her and go and sin no more, he not only freed her from the bondage of sin and removed the yoke of slavery of sin from around her neck, but he gave her the true word of the Most High and set her body and soul free and her spirit eternally. Furthermore, he literally gave her a license to speak. When you testify, you tell your story. And to tell your story, you have to use words and use your mouth to speak. She was given permission by the Son of God to tell her testimony of how the Lord saved her and freed her. She was able to go out into the world and become a great witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about it. She was about to be stoned to death in a court of public opinion, according to the law of Moses. But Jesus, he spoke up about the injustice and revealed their lack of knowledge and shamed them for not knowing who he was. He said, let him without sin cast the first stone. See, no one could cast a stone but him because he was the only one not born in sin. That's the one thing no one in the world can say. We are all sinners. The great and final battle, the battle of good versus evil is ahead. For every child of God defeats this evil world. And we achieve this victory through our faith. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And Jesus Christ was revealed as God's Son by his baptism in water and by shedding his blood on the cross. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And the spirit who is truth confirms it with his testimony. So we have these three witnesses, the Lord, the word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And we have three witnesses on earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And all three agree. Since we believe human testimony, surely we can believe the greater testimony that comes from God. And God has testified about his son. All who believe in the Son of God know in their hearts that this testimony is true. Those who don't believe this are actually calling God a liar because they don't believe what God has testified about his Son. That's 1 John chapter 5, verse 6 through 10. This is confirmation of what I said earlier about Jesus being the prophet, the priest, and the king all rolled up into one man, and all three agreed. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, twelve kinds of fruit, the tribes of Israel, with a fresh crop each month many coming to Christ. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse upon anything, for the throne of God and the Lamb will be there, and his servants will worship him, and they will see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads. His name will always be on their minds, and there will be no night darkness there, no need for lamps, the apostles, or son, the physical body of Jesus. For the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. Then the angel said to me, Everything you have heard and seen is trustworthy and true. The Lord God, who inspires his prophets, the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to tell his servants what will happen soon, suddenly or quickly. Look, I'm coming soon. Blessed are those who obey the words of prophecy written in this book or scroll. I, John, am the one who heard and saw all these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said, no, don't worship me. I am a servant of God, just like you and your brothers, the prophets, as well as all who obey what is written in this book? Worship only 
God. Then he instructed me, do not seal up the prophetic words in this book, for the time is near. Let the one who is doing harm continue to do harm. Let the one who is vile continue to be vile. Let the one who is righteous continue to live righteously. Let the one who is holy continue to be holy. Look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. I am the Alpha. The Mises, meaning in the midst of, and the Omega, the first, the creator, the center, and the last, the beginning, the middle, and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes. They will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit from the tree of life. Outside the city are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idol worshipers, and all who love to live a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this message for the churches. I am both the source of David and the heir to his throne. I am the root and offspring of David. I am the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears this say, come. Let anyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who desires drink freely from the water of life. And I solemnly declare to everyone who hears the words of prophecy written in this book, if anyone adds anything to what is written here, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. And if anyone removes any of the words from this book of prophecy, God will remove that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city that are described in this book. He who is the faithful witness to all these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's holy people. Revelation 22, 1 through 21. Our faith is going to be tested in this season more than ever before. And only those with enough oil in their lamps will survive this great time of tribulation. That's the end of chapter four. I know that was a short but powerful chapter. So I will continue on the fifth day of Hanukkah with chapter five, which is titled The Potter and the Clay. So yeah, I hope that you heard something that blessed you and uh, I pray that you are walking in the spirit, that you are fully armored with your sword in your hand and being a, a willing and obedient servant and allowing the Holy Spirit to use you because we are in the last days. Bye now.